Well, welcome back to day two of the CIQC Spring School on Quantum Error Correction. I hope you enjoyed day one as much as I did. And if you see Jens Paulsberg around in the chat room or in Gathertown, please make sure and thank him for such an inspiring lecture that really set the stage for the whole school. Today, I have the pleasure of introducing our next lecturer, Ken Brown from Duke University. Ken is a true Renaissance man. He's a professor of electrical computer engineering, physics, and chemistry, which I think represents most of the disciplines that are here today. And because of that, I think you're all well poised to realize the challenges that uh, gives to a lecturer, being able to teach freshman chemistry to chemist, impedance matching to engineers and thermodynamics to physicists takes a lecturer of the highest caliber. And that's exactly what we have in Ken today. Ken's research interests span uh, a lot of areas, many of them close to my own heart. He's one of the originators of the of work on trapped molecular ions, which may someday be used in quantum computing. He's interested in quantum computing ion trapping, broadly defined. He's especially well known for his important contributions to quantum error correction, which we'll hear about some today. For this work, he's number, won a number of awards. He's a Kavli Fellow, Humboldt Fellow, APS Fellow, and he's a member of the greatest MURI team there ever was. So. Please join me in welcoming Ken to today's school, and I hope you enjoy it as much as we did day one. All right, Eric, great. Thanks for an introduction. It truly was the greatest Murray team of all time, and uh, it's, yeah. May, may we have, ever have a Murray almost as good as that in the future. Um, let me just share my screen and get started. Yeah, and please, um, please put questions into the Q and A, uh, and I will stop for questions, of course. But I'm also happy to like, if something is pressing, just say urgent, and and Shulin will hopefully interrupt me. Uh, yeah, so today I'm going to talk just about quantum error correction. Um, I'm a professor at Duke University, and then I just have to disclose that I'm also a scientific advisor for the startup INQ. Um, let's get started. So the way to think about error correction that I really like um, attributed to John Preskill is this idea that basically you want to fight entanglement with entanglement. So you have had some kind of quantum computer, which you put into this like entangled state. And then when it entangles with the environment, um, you actually are able to like fix that, that um, loss of information to the environment. I also like to think about quantum error correction as you're basically trying to make a procedure where you have your clipboard of things you want it to do. And then there's some devil, um, this is the logo of the Duke library, who's also sending it messages. And so you need to make sure your messages still work, even though someone else is trying to write into the same machine. Um, so today's lecture, uh, I'm gonna start with some PowerPoint slides, um, which I think will take on the order of a half hour. Uh, where I'm just going to do an overview of picking up um, from Yen's lecture on basic classical codes, talk about stabilizers a little bit, talk about poly errors, and they just give you some examples of quantum codes. Then the lecture is going to take, um, take a turn to a little more, uh, maybe more specifically mathematic, um, where we're going to actually look at kind of some of the assumptions we made above and decide whether or not they're reasonable. Um, and then we're actually at the end, we're going to tie really closely with Yen's great lecture from yesterday, which is that basically most quantum codes that we use today are classical linear codes. So we can use all of this classical linear coding theory that was discussed yesterday um, to work out all kinds of quantum codes. Okay, so classical error correction again, you have some channel. The way I think about it is you have a channel. You want to send zero, 85% of the time you get zero, 15% of the time you get one. And then imagine you have a binary symmetric channel, so it's equally likely to flip bits both sides. As we learned yesterday, uh, the easiest way to handle this is a repetition code. Basically, what I think is you send one bit at a time, and every bit has a chance to flip. Second bit has a chance to flip. Third bit has a chance to flip. And then you just do majority vote on the output. 
And then because of this majority vote in this example of where things go wrong 85% of the time, the logical channel uh, does better. Uh, you get the message through 94% of the time. Uh, I really liked um, this, this point that Jens made in terms of thinking about space of code words. So we have three bits. So we have two to the three possible bit strings, but we only pick two of them to be our code words. And then we can imagine building um, this sort of cube, hypercube, um, where, the, where errors correspond to moving to strings which are away from the code word. And if we move just a little bit away, we know how to map back. But if we move too far, we get confused. So in this particular example, we can correct one bit flip. Um, we can detect two bit flips, but we can't correct it. And if we have three bit flips, we actually go from one um, logical state to another logical state. Now, um, uh, we need to bring in some quantum. Uh, anyway, now we need to bring in some quantum. And I, I do think one challenge of the school is I don't know exactly people's background in quantum information in general. Uh, so um, we'll go over this and then we'll probably take a quick question. So um, for a quantum computer, like the fundamental unit is a qubit. And so a quantum bit is a two level quantum system uh, with two levels, zero and one, just like a bit. But the state is actually a complex vector in this two dimensional space. Um, because it's a vector, we can think about matrices that manipulate that vector. So the bit flip ends up being this um, 0, 1, 1, 0 matrix called X. And for the classical bit, that's kind of all we have. Um, quantum mechanically, we have these two other things. So Z, which we'll think of as a phase flip, um, which doesn't make any sense, uh, <laughs> doesn't make any sense classically because it has to do with relative phase between these two values. And then Y, which we think of as a bit flip and a phase flip. Um, later in the second part of the, the um, discussion, we are going to have to talk a little bit about mixed states. So the way I think about a mixed state is that you're trying to buy good quantum states from a vendor who is very shady. So instead of sending you just a bottle of this state, they send you a bottle of this state until they run out of it, and then they add extra states. And so when you measure values, which we can again measure these poly X's, poly Y's, and poly Z's, um, the expected values here represented by AX, AY, and AZ um, basically depend on whatever the mixture inside is. Um, so again, you may be familiar from, from physics or chemistry of using sigma X, sigma Y, sigma Z for poly operators, but in quantum computing, we just use capital X, capital Y, capital Z um, most of the time. All right, so any questions on this single qubit slide? I I guess um, Shilin looks good. Um, it's good. Okay. Okay. So now here's the problem. How are we going to take the single qubits and encode them in a way where we can fix errors? Um, and it's really pretty challenging. Um, the first challenge is that you can't copy uh, this no cloning theorem. Um, derives from the unitary of quantum mechanics. The other thing is we want to preserve the superposition, so we cannot directly take a majority vote. So let's just imagine we have our wave function, and we now want to put it into this repetition code, so it becomes a0 plus b111. Now imagine a bit flip happens on this um, zeroth bit here, and um, in the and then we have this superposition. So the first thing you should notice is that, well, actually these coefficients don't change. So that's good news. Somehow like the, the relative information is still there. Uh, the bad news is if I measure all three bits, I either get one zero zero or zero one one, and then I can't fix it. I've lost, I've lost that information with probability a squared and b squared. So, um, we know from yesterday's lecture that if we think about parities and the parity check matrix, that's actually a way to determine where the error occurs without actually learning the message. 
Now, classically, that's kind of goofy because you just measure all the bits and then you do your parity check on your measured bits. But we see that these um, the parity checks uh, basically are even when we have code words. And when there is an error, some of the parity checks will become off. So the way we do this um, quantum mechanically is we imagine an operator which allows us to measure the parity without measuring any information about the, the logical code. Work. So in this case, um, this parity check comes from two a tensor product of Z um, poly operators on the qubits. Uh, we then, um, if an error occurs, we see that the, this disagreement between bits corresponds to a negative one uh, with respect to this, this check, um, right? So one is agreement, negative one is disagreement. And for any of these errors, we again see this the same pattern and it relates directly to the classical bit parity um, through this uh, exponentiation of these bit values. So this is really quite, um, yeah, this is really quite promising. It tells us it, it, it's our first hint that we can use a lot of tools from classical error correction to do quantum error correction. Um, the, the challenge is really just this slightly indirect way of measuring things. All right, so any questions before I start off on the stabilizer formalism? I see there are a couple of questions. Sheila, do you wanna? Yeah, so the first question is like, uh, when there's uh, an exterior error, uh, an error under the zero qubit, why the coefficient A and B doesn't change when they're, yeah. Ah, okay, that's a great question. So the um, the X uh, operator only changes the local value of this qubit. So this coefficient, which are coefficients between these two entangled states, uh, remain unchanged. It doesn't act. It doesn't. Um, that's one way to put it. A different way to put it is that x zero takes these two. Um, you know, separate, uh, <laughs> separate basis states to again orthogonal basis states, which we'll see is actually critical for error correction in a little bit. And the other question is like, how does a double Z gate know the parity? Yeah. So if you look at um, um, the Z gate. Uh, what it does is it basically gives you a one if the state is zero, and it gives you a minus one if the state is one. Um, and so if I put two of them together, I get, uh, and this is actually what this second side of the equation says, it says that, well, if they're both one, I get minus one times minus one, which is one. And if they're both zero, I get minus one times minus one, which is, or sorry, one times one, which is one. And if they're different, it doesn't matter which way, I get a one times a minus one, and I get the negative one pair. Yeah. Yes, there is. There's a ton of questions now. <laughs> um, another question is like, what does BJ makes one and two? DJ tends to decay. Yeah. Uh, sorry, Shalyn, I missed what you're saying. Uh, what is this um, BJ in the exponent of DJ tends to Z, um, ZK? Oh, so it just, yeah. it just la yeah, it just labels the bits. So, 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 so BJ is the classical value of the bit J. ZJ is the, the, the Z operator on qubit J. And it turns out this product is equal to these bit values in that basis state. Um, <laughs> yeah, the, uh, like, uh, can you elaborate on the Z1, Z2, Z0 that is used for parity checking? Yeah, let me, let, let me come back to that um, uh, 
later, but they all, there, there are tensor, uh, tensor products of these individual Zs. Um, and we'll see, uh, anyway, we'll, we'll see how that works a little bit more in the stabilizer part. And then we'll, um, when we get to the, the end of the lecture, we'll see how we can actually um, take parity check matrices of classical codes and use them to write down what the right stabilizers are. So um, if nothing looks too urgent, um, Shilin, I think I'll move on. Okay, so I'll, I'll, ask the, I'll answer the rest of the questions. Okay. Oh yeah, and I just want to say Shilin is a, a graduate student who uh, works with me here at Duke. Um, we've been working a lot on quantum error correction, uh, all types of <laughs> all types of quantum error correction. Um, okay. So I want to discuss the stabilizer formalism, and it depends on this idea of tensor products and multiple poly operators. Um, we're going to choose that these poly operators will have eigenvalues plus or minus one. So they're Hermitian and also their own inverses. Um, and so then this, um, this, this, this set of operators, we can just represent as a series of different poly operators on different bits. And then we have this plus minus one in front, which we may or may not use later. Um, I will write them in two ways. And I apologize, I just realized one of my slides, I shifted my bit order. Normally I'll go from bit zero to bit, whatever the end bit is. Um, all of the qubits that are not mentioned, there's an identity that acts on them. Um, and then, so these, right, so x0 looks like x and then a bunch of identities. x3, y4 looks like two identities, x, y, and then identities. Um, and then we see here this negative x, z, x, 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 z uh, has, you know, non-trivial poly operators on each piece. Um, I will also refer to the weight of poly operators. So the weight of poly operators will be um, the number of non-identity elements in this, this group, in this, yeah, in this element. So this is a weight one operator. This weight two operator, and this last one is a weight five operator. All right, next definition has to do with stabilizer states. So um, we, you know, okay, so I'm a, uh, yeah, I'm actually a chemist initially by training. So <clears throat> when I think about quantum states, I always think about complete set of commuting operators. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to build up a certain type of complete set of commuting operators, and that will lead to certain types of states. So we define the operator M, any operator, as a stabilizer of the state psi if when M acts on psi, nothing happens. <coughs> Sorry, it's pretty pollen here today. So for N qubits, um, we have n commuting independent poly operators will stabilize one state. So the way I think about it is every poly operator cuts space in half. So I have two to the n possible states. Every poly operator cuts it in half because it'll be half plus one eigenvalue, half minus one eigenvalue. We only keep the plus one side. Now I have two to the n minus one states. I apply another commuting poly operator. It cuts that space in half and so on and so on. So like I think big Hilbert space and we just slice, 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 slice until we get the single state. Um, so here are some examples. So if I want to write down um, a, a classical state like zero, 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 what I do is I just stabilize each bit. Zero is stabilized by Z by definition. So I just write Z, I, I. I, Z, I, 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 Z. Now you'll notice I have these funny um, brackets here. Um, and here what I mean um, is a, <laughs> a group is generated. So these Z, I, 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 Z, I, 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 Z all stabilize this. 
But we also know um, that the product, ZII times IZI, uh, right, the parity of these agree, so it also stabilizes. So we see um, in this three qubit state space, right, there are two to the three dimensional Hilbert space, I can choose three poly operators that commute, and that defines easily this state, D defines one state, right? Um, you can work in different bases. So I will uh, a little bit use um, X bases, Z bases, and Y bases. Um, my definition is the eigenstate of positive eigenstate of X is plus, um, the negative eigenstate of X is minus, the positive eigenstate of Y is plus I, the negative eigenstate of Y is minus I. This minus sign in here means that the negative um, state of Y is stabilized, which is why we get this minus I. Um, yeah, and I'm sure this brought some questions. Any questions, Shalom? Yeah, um, there are only like um, tens of questions, so. <laughs> Um, maybe I mean I should uh, read the last one. Like, um, yeah, just the, good, try to try to like you know pull them together. Like, what's the big question? Like, um, I think I think many of the, um, many people ask questions like, um, how do we measure these um, Z operators? Um, just check up theories and and also um, like um, does the step term stepwise come from the concept of of step either of the group. And um, yeah, can, can you answer, like, um, try to briefly answer this question? Uh, um, yeah, there's connections between stabilizers and stabilizer groups. Um, I'm not, so my, uh, <laughs> I'm planning to aim more towards the connections to classical. Uh, coding theory, so I'm not going to go too much into the group detail. Um, I do think this basic idea in terms of the states and the code spaces, that M basically preserves that code space, um, is, uh, yeah, that's what I think of as the stabilization in this case. Um, in terms of the measurement, um, I will, yeah, I will talk about that much later. So, so like how one could do the measurements. Um, I'll talk about it again. Also, there's an urgent question. Like, uh, could you please talk about commuting of operators and how they work? <laughs> yes. Uh, uh, yes, that is an urgent question for sure. Um, Okay, um, briefly, um, the, this, this commutation, I cannot go into too much detail, um, but is like critical for quantum operations. And the basic idea is imagine you have an op, uh, some state and then you have two possible operations And the question is, are these things equal? So if they are equal, then they commute. Sorry. 
the commute. Um, yeah, let me put this tablet down so I can write better. Um, okay, that's generally true, but here's the key thing for today is that x z equals minus z x. And this is true for any pair of poly operators. So we would be say, you know, x and z don't commute. Um, the second point I want to make now so we can work because it'll show up on X in the next slide is what's interesting is X1, X2 times Z1, Z2 equals, um, so X is, X is commute with each other, X is commute with each other. Z is commute with each other. Um, and in this case, like the, um, this question of support, right? X acts on keep it one, Z acts on keep, Z one acts on keep it one, X two acts on keep it two, Z two acts on keep it two. So this is equal to minus Z one X one minus Z two X two um, X J. Um, yeah, sorry, I left off one thing, I'll just say. So, um, right, so if these um, operators are acting on different qubits, they commute, and therefore I can move these things past each other. And then when I do that, I see that I get these two negative signs here. And so those cancel out. And so when I rearrange it, I find Z1, Z2, X1, X2. Um, so, so the products commute, right? So this is a great, this is a, this is nice because it's a good example for what we want to do next. Um, but yeah, so again, generically, there's a lot of things that can happen when things don't commute. Um, for today, uh, we're mostly just interested in Z versus X. And the key thing is that one Z crossing one X leads to a minus sign. Two X's crossing two Z's leads to no change. Um, I guess um, if you have time, um... Can you try to elaborate more about using the stabilizers to half the state space? Like, um, what is it used for? Or do you want to uh, cover it like, later? Or uh, yeah, let me. I will. That's reason. Okay. So let's use our example of, um, so in the Z basis, we have zero, 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 one, zero, one, zero, zero, one, one, and zero, zero. Okay, we have these. Um, these are these are our uh, eight um, Z basis eigenstates. So now, if I pick one stabilizer to be Z I I, what that does is it fixes the value of the first bit to be zero, and so it cuts the space in half, where this is the positive side. And this is the negative side. So then when I do this again with um, the second bit, uh, 
I yeah, it's I <laughs> just based on how I put them, right? The it's kind of a funny cut. So these are the positive parts of the second one, and this is the negative part of the second one. Um, and therefore, right now, right, so I've gone from if I have no stabilizers, I have eight states, then I have four states, then I have two states. And then when I put in um, the last choice, uh, which, yeah. There's only one state left, which satisfies, basically satisfies all three conditions. And so that's what I mean by cutting it out. Um, yeah, and then let, let me continue showing because I think the next slide is useful for this. Um, so yeah, so here, here's the question. So everybody just take a second and think about, well, what is the state um, which is preserved by this stabilizer, this set of stabilizer generators? All right, so what I'll do is I'll just, just, we'll just run through it. So I'm worried about XXX, so I'm gonna ignore it. Um, ZZZ and IZZ, uh, those look good to me because they're like the, um, they, they, they look like the sort of things we've been um, looking at, which is parodies of single key mistakes. So now I'm going to start writing everything again um, in the in in the Z basis. Uh, yeah, I'll just do it in normal. Um, okay, so now the um, this blue guy, what does it mean? It means in the Z basis, these two states have to be, um, have the same parity. So I just circle those guys, this guy, this guy, um, this guy, this guy. And then this one says um, the second state have to have the same parity. The second two qubits have to have the same parity. So that's this one and this one. Okay, now we have to do something new which is I say, well, what happens if I apply XXX to zero, zero, zero? Well, X is a bit flip. So every bit is flipped independently. Um, uh, yeah, every, yeah every, every, every bit is flipped independently. And so then we, we get, these two states. So what's good is that this, um, because of the commutation, this state actually uh, connects between two things which satisfy the blue check and the green check, uh, the blue stabilizer generator and the green stabilizer generator. But then the purple stabilizer generator means that I need to satisfy this plus plus relationship. And that's only preserved by one state.
and then I apologize. I meant to say, you know, so zero 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 is shorthand for zero tensor zero tensor zero. And then in quantum computing, we usually just write this because we're always working with these bit strings. Um, so this is like increasing shorthand. Yeah, so that's that's how we can solve this example. Um, she learned any, well, let me record a type it. So yeah, so anyway, we just wrote down this, this state on the other piece of paper. Um, and now what we wanna do is we wanna move um, from states to code spaces. So for n qubits, if we choose only m stabilizers, then there's basically some extra degrees of freedom which become the logical qubits. So k equals n minus m logical qubits are free. And so when we look at this stabilizer generators, we should note first that these are exactly the two parity checks of this original classical code. And it naturally leads to a logical qubit with this encoded zero logical and one logical, which are again, just these repetition codes. And then the logical operators um, become X logical, which has to flip all three bits to go from zero to one. And then Z logical, which is just a single Z because uh, I only have to apply a phase to here or to, the, to this one. I can do that by applying a Z to any of these bits. Um, and I'll take some questions here again. Should I? Oh, just a comment, like, uh, please slow down before you move on. Like, um, um, also, um, also um, uh, someone asked, like, should 3X operator also start by plus, plus, plus state? And what are the, what are the restrictions on what states we are trying to stabilize? Yeah, so the first question is great, which is, um, let me, I'll go back to my notepad. Um, um, yeah, so yeah, so it's true. So XXX stabilizes plus, plus, plus by definition. But we see that if I apply ZZI to plus, 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 um, we need one more piece of information. So I think it's important to know that X on zero equals one, X on one equals zero, Z on plus, uh, my computer just crashed. It's great. Um, Z on plus equals uh, uh, minus and um, Z on minus equals, um, uh, yeah, Z on minus equals plus. But let me go back here. And then the question of what to stabilize. So, so, so we use stabilizer states for different things. So sometimes we use stabilizer states just to kind of understand the quantum system as a whole. And then sometimes we use stabilizer states to, um, um, it, it, I mean, obviously today we're using it for quantum error correction. So what's nice about it is we're basically gonna find stabilizer subspaces, um, which define a code space from which we can correct errors, which is what's going on here. So we define this code space, um, the, uh, right, which is this just repetition code. And then on that code space, we can apply, we can define logical poly operators, X logical and Z logical. And then um, we notice that X logical is no longer part of the stabilizers, right? It's, it's something else. Because if I add it and I say, oh, also X logical has to be plus one, then I've confined myself to only one state. There's no more code space. There's only plus logical, which is an equal superposition of zero logical and one logical.
So um, one other question is like, um, if you're not careful about the set of operators, would you accidentally not be able to stabilize any state? Yes, yes, yes. Uh, and I, I actually have a nice example in, in a couple of slides of that. Um, yeah, you need to make sure the stabilizers commute with each other. Like the stabilizer generators have to commute with each other because they're, um, Yeah, because you want to have this particular so for poly stabilizers, we definitely need them to commute with each other because we have this action on the state has to be um, has to always be one, even if I multiply them in different orders. And if they don't commute, the 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 really nice property of poly operators is that they either commute or they anti-commute, meaning that you get this minus one. Um, so so as long as they commute, then everything continues to be stabilized. Also, I think an urgent question is that what is the difference between stabilizer and stabilizer generator? Yeah, so, um, okay, so, okay, first a word of warning, which is that people almost always say stabilizer when they mean the stabilizer generators. Um, the, it, I think it's stabilizer generators is too long for us to say consistently. So this is a great example, right? I only choose only M stabilizers. <laughs> uh, what I really mean to say is I choose only M independent stabilizers that generate the whole stabilizer group. So for example, in this case, the stabilizer is ZZI and IZZ, but there's a third stabilizer, which is ZIZ, which is basically comes from the product of these two things. And then there's always the fourth stabilizer in this case, which is identity, because identity always stabilizes everything. But with respect to the parity check, I just want to point out that um, here, uh, when you look at the parity check matrix for the repetition code, you only need two checks, because the third check is just redundant information. So that's why we mostly focus on these stabilizer generators, because that extra extra stabilizers outside of those generators are just giving us redundant, redundant information. So what we can see here is Z0, Z1, Z1, Z2 are say our two stabilizers, Z0 gener stabilizer generators, Z0, Z2 is the extra stabilizer, but we see that its value is always just the product of the first two. And therefore it doesn't tell us anything. else look urgent Sheila? Um, also like um is there a reason why you choose these operators as logical operators like are they unique like what is the criteria for this yeah so um the main reason i pick the logical operators like i do is um the they're defined um right they're defined by the operative i'm <laughs> So, I'm sorry, it just sounds like a terrible sentence. It's, the operators are defined by the operation. Uh, <laughs> but what I mean is I want an operator which takes me from zero logical to one logical. Um, and I've chosen, um, you know, x0, x1, x2. Um, I, I can, I will, give me a second to bring my tablet back up. But, um, we can show that it's uh, unique up to stabilizers. No, this is still, sorry. I will continue on and hopefully this thing will come together in a second. Yeah, right. So again, um, plus logical is this. And then um, the key thing is it's not a right, it's not copying because here, here, when you just look in the 
in this case, in the Z basis, it looks like we've just copied the information. But if I was in the plus state initially, I couldn't just copy it to three plus states. That would not be a logical plus state. Um, yeah, so let me, let's just do a few more examples. So the way I think about it is in this classical code, I have three repeating pieces of information. Um, and then if one of the bits flips, there's a disagreement in this parity. And so I can do majority vote and fix it. Um, but I can also just measure this parity. And then I know that this, that I should flip this top um, spin uh, either way. And the important thing is by just looking at the parity, uh, again, it doesn't depend on what the information that's encoded here. It could have been um, zeros or ones. And what I think about it is I've taken this space, uh, which has eight states, and I've broken it into four subspaces, which have, um, which have two states. And so this code state is here, but any error that happens, any single bit flip that happens, will map me to a different subspace. But as we saw in the example, um, it preserves the uh, it preserves the coefficients between these points. So all I need to do to fix things is just map it back to this original subspace. And I do that by implying the like I detect the error is x, and then I apply the gate x, which then fixes the error x. So again, let's just look at it from the perspective of the wave function. So here is just some arbitrary wave function encoded in this logical qubit. An error occurs, which flips this middle bit. I check my two um, stabilizers, and I find that they're both minus one. So this one's minus one, right? Because these, uh, these guys disagree. This one's minus one because E2Z3 disagrees. Um, and then I just correct by applying an X to the middle space and I get back exactly, right, exactly the state that I started with. Um, and that's sort of the process of, of, of how to do this measurement. Um, now, this code is an quantum code because uh, what happens if a phase flip happens? So if an error occurs on the first qubit here, you get this negative sign because Z1 on this one is a minus sign, Z1 on zero is plus, so I get nothing. And when I measure these uh, checks, everything's fine. Oh, this parity is good between these guys, parity is good between these guys, right? Just everything's great. Um, however, the state has changed. And when I look at the overlap between the state I started in and the state I actually have, it will vary between one and zero. So if it's a classical state, meaning that um, theta is either zero or pi, then the overlap is perfect. Um, if it's a logical plus state um, where theta is pi over two, then there's no overlap, right? Because the Z1 acts like this logical Z operator. Uh, okay, so the problem, um, the way that I think about it is when I move to this quantum setting, I basically now have two distances. I have a distance, right? If I think about these logical operators, the weights, I think about them as the weight um, error bit strings from yesterday's lecture. Um, I have, yeah, very different distances. So the, the logical bit string to disrupt the, the Z side is three, so we can do correction. Um, but the logical 
string to disrupt the X side is just one weight one poly operator. And so I would draw this sometimes like this. So there's, uh, these are my three bits. These are my two stabilizers corresponding to Z, 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 Z. This is the logical Z operator, it's just a point. Um, this is the logical X operator, which is this line. And then um, let me see if I can get this. All right, Ken, is everything working for you now? It looks good from our side. Yeah, th things seem good. Um, hopefully okay, well, I think we're ready to resume if you are. Um, perfect. So, um, all right, so just looking through the questions, the one thing we'll see is that we can correct while keeping the quantum information because the measurement doesn't answer any questions about um, doesn't ask any questions about the logical information. It only asks question information about the, like where the errors are. And we'll, we'll, we'll see that more examples of that. Um, there's a question about the uniqueness of stabilizers. So let's just take, for example, the state plus, plus, plus. Um, the full stabilizer group is all possible x's here, right? So i, 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 x, i, i, x, i, da, 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 da. and that is unique. That uniquely defines this state because there are no more degrees of freedom. Um, and this is what the whole stabilizer looks like. Um, sometimes there's a little bit of confusion because um, we're free to choose any set of generators. And so um, below, I've written kind of like the, this is like maybe standard choice of generator. Um, but I could easily pick this generator. Um, so let me just label this guy S1, S2, S3. I'll call this S prime one, S prime two, S prime three. Um, and we see that S1 equals S prime one. S2 equals S1 prime, S2 prime. S3 equals um, S2 prime, S3 prime. So, so they're completely, they, they, they generate through multiplication of these poly operators, um, remembering that 
xj xj equals i. Um, yeah, they, they generate through these, uh, through multiplication, the same, the same total set of stabilizers, the same group, um, but they don't necessarily, um, uh, well, yeah, but they may look different, right? Because the, I maybe only tell you the generators and therefore they look like they're different kind of objects. So now on the, on the side of logical operators, um, you know, we have XL times SIL. In our example, XL is uh, X1, X2, X3. And we see that X1, X2, X3 on 0, 0, 0 flips every bit. Um, and therefore, X logical on 0 logical equals 1 logical which is by definition what we want to have happen. Now, they're not unique because of, um, basically because of the, the stabilizer space. So we know that any stabilizer, let's call it SA, um, Um, and so as a result, uh, we can do um, we can do the following. We can take um, XL psi L. We can bring out some stabilizer. And so then this um, is also a logical X. So it'll always be logical X multiplied by the stabilizer. Um, so in our case, we can take X1, X2, X3, and then we pull out Z1, Z2. Um, and, okay, and then, so X, J times Z J um, equals mine. This is another property of these. We yeah, we just introduce the multiplication as we need it. So when I multiply this together, it becomes minus y1, y2, x3. Um, so that's also an equally good logical operator. Uh, there's a question back here about um, should I also circle uh, these two guys in green? And and I should have. I um, just didn't circle them because I was trying to focus this down to things which also satisfy blue. Um, So, so generically, it's easy to write down um, the state. If I give you the stabilizers, there's a computationally easy way to write down the states, um, basically based on this um, splitting kind of method. Uh, yeah. Yeah, and then we'll talk a little bit about um, we, we, 
may connect it a little bit to being able to do sort of Clifford operations as a way to get there. Okay, so then um, the other thing I wanted to point out uh, with respect to our current example is that, um, right, Z logical is Z1, but Z logical times some stabilizer is just Z2. So somehow um, in this code, any any single qubit z is the same as any other single qubit z. Um, and and I think a good question is what is a logical operator? Um, so a logical operator. Uh, generally is, yeah, is, anyway, is a quantum operation that preserves the subspace. Um, and so for us, we typically just make them out of, um, uh, yeah, we, we end up just making that. It's, it's convenient to think about constructing them from logical poly operators. So then we just find you know, a logical Z, which takes logical plus to logical minus. And we find a logical X. which takes zero to one. Um, and, and by preserving the subspace, we know that they have to commute with the, um, they have to commute with the stabilizers. Because, um, <laughs> yeah, because because these two, because the stabilizer will always just do nothing on the code space. So if the logical operator, applying the logical operator first and then applying a stabilizer is different than applying the stabilizer and then the logical operator, um, then, yeah, then basically you can show that the what you thought was the logical operator doesn't keep you in the code space. All right, um, back to Okay, so <laughs> where are we? We're, we have a classical code written in a quantum way, right? We don't have a quantum code yet. So we'd like to, to get a quantum code. Um, and as a, yeah, I don't know, as a motivating way that I think about it, um, you basically start with uh, these weight to parity checks, Z type parity checks and X type parity checks. And that makes this um, compass model. And when we look at this code, uh, when, I, when I draw it on PowerPoint, it looks great because if an X error happens here, it should destabilize these two Z stabilizers. If a Z error happens up top, it should destabilize these two X stabilizers. And if a Y error happens, it should you know, destabilize all four things. So it looks pretty promising. Um, but in the end, this is a, a fiction. It's like a, a fun PowerPoint fiction, um, which is basically, yeah, so okay. again, it looks like everything can be corrected. Wait a moment, happily. Um, but it's a fiction because these Z checks and X checks don't commute with each other. 
So if you just think about this corner case, there's like an overlap of one Z with one X. And what that means is that there's no state which can be stabilized by both of those checks. Um, you also can, I mean, so yeah, so when you first look at it, there should be a few things that come to mind. First thing that comes to mind is like, well, actually there are only nine degrees of freedom. So if I have 12 stabilizers, <laughs> I have like negative qubits. I've like used too many degrees of freedom. That's one tip that it's not gonna work. And then the second thing again, is just that because this is um, X check here, and Z check here, only intersect at a single point, they're not gonna commute. And so there's no, um, there's no code which, which there's no state that can be stabilized by both of those operators at the same time. All right, so we can, I like this model because we can take pairs of these bond checks. It's, it's definitely more a physics view of the code, right? So we, we're gonna take pairs of these spin operators and we're gonna put them together into higher weight spin operators. Um, so that they commute with each other. And what I like about it is, um, even though it wasn't derived this way, uh, it leads to the shore code, which we'll talk about in more detail. So in the shore code, you basically have um, these three copies of a repetition code, these three lines, which allow us to fix X errors. Um, and then these red gates, or sorry, then, the, then we take these three X type um, checks and we put them into one giant weight six stabilizer. And as we'll see um, in a moment, that gives us the ability to correct Z errors. Um, skipping Bacon Shore, although it's my favorite code. Uh, and then the compass code, Sorry, sorry, the, the surface code, the rotated surface code, um, where you have kind of a checkerboard of weight four checks. And then for the rotated code at the end, at the edges, you have these little weight two checks um, also can be derived from the compass code. Though again, it wasn't, that wasn't how, <laughs> wasn't how it was discovered. But I like it because it, 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 for me intuitively, I like it because you basically think, okay, I have like a, repetition code that fixes X's and a repetition code that fixes Z's, that doesn't exactly work. So now how do I fix it to make these other types of codes? All right, so now I'm gonna go into this detail on the short code. Um, so short code is an example of a code which, um, you can think of it as basically a code inside of a code. So at the bottom level, what we see is that um, we just have a repetition code on each column. And then on each column, there's an associated logical operator for X, which is distance three and an associated logical operator for Z, which is just, um, yeah, just again, a single Z. So then to make the level two code is I switch my basis from a Z type basis to an X type basis. And then I replace the physical Z poly operator with the logical X poly operator of the level one code. Um, and they, uh, yeah, that's it. So we see that instead of having a parity check in Z, we now have a parity check in logical X. And then it follows naturally that the level, this level two code its logical X operator will just be one logical X from any of these pieces, just like the here, the logical Z was just one Z. But now the logical Z has to require three Zs on each of these uh, points. And so what, but what, so what Shore realized, right? So this, I mean, I just want to, <laughs> I just want to 
like, you know, okay, what has Peter Shore done for quantum computing? Oh, he found Shor's factoring algorithm, which is like a use like a useful application which immediately got uh, governments in particular very concerned. Uh, people at the time said, well, you can't fix it because you know there's no way to do error correction with quantum mechanics. That's what people that people really said that at the time. And then Peter Shore is like, oh, well, here's just one quantum error correcting code. Basically, back to back 1994, 1995. And what's great about this code is it really is just two classical repetition codes, which, which are um, laid on top of each other. Um, yeah, I'll take some questions, Sheila. I still have you. Well, one question. Yeah, could you could you please like elaborate more on compass that compass that one? Yeah. Um, let me go back. Okay. So I should have spent a little more time here, which is um. Yeah, I will, I guess, share over here. Okay, so um, when I think about the classical, uh, yeah, I will say many different things, um, whatever appeals to you, um, whatever appeals to you, Hopefully, something will, will stick with your background. Okay, so we know the parity check matrix um, for the repetition code can be written like this. And when we switch to this quantum picture, um, When we switch to this quantum picture, uh, we've sort of replaced them with the Z1, Z2, Z3. And then we see that a single X error here um, And this I just I'm going to emphasize the this commutation issue. Right, a single X1 error doesn't commute with Z1, Z2. And so it, it, it tells us the parity is flipped, which is the exact same um, when I think about this parity, parity check code and thinking about an error string, which looks like one, zero, zero. Now, that's great. We can fix bit flips, but we can't fix phase flips. Um, so then uh, it's natural to think, well, actually, I know that there's a gate called the Hadamard. Um, and the Hadamard has the nice property that if I apply it to x, um, I get z. And if I apply it to z, I get x. Um, and uh, yeah, so, so then you could say, oh, OK, well, this is an easy problem to fix. <laughs> I'm just going to make a different code, which looks like So here's the first code, again, Z1, Z2, Z2, Z3. I just make another code, which looks like X1, X2, X2, X3. And so the top code fixes X errors, bottom code fixes Z errors.
but they don't fix the other error, right? That's the problem. And so the, um, the motivation for thinking about this um, compass code is, well, how could, I, how could I stitch these two things together? And so what we see is that, right, this line should fix against X errors, and this line should fix against Z errors. And then by making this um, lattice, uh, we should be able to correct both. Um, also, um, people are asking like um, how, how you can do this error correction without collapsing this state. Because uh, I think many people has asked it, have asked this. Yeah, let me let me go back to this um, back to the board. All right. So again, we'll just we use our, our example of um, our, our some quantum state. Okay. The way uh, um, yeah, sorry, I'm pausing because like I uh, let me um, pausing because there's a million ways to say it. Um, Here's one way I think is kind of interesting, which is we can ask, um, this state is written as the eigenstates of C1, Z2, Z3. Um, but I could actually write it in another, I can always, in quantum mechanics, right? I can always write it in a different basis. So, um, I'm going to write it in the basis Z logical S1 um, in terms of the logical operator and the stabilizers. So when I write that, um, It's oh. Okay, when I write it like this, what you notice, um, what you may notice, is that actually the state sort of moves um, yeah, the state basically moves it, it basically I more or less can separate it. So a Right. Okay. So, so when I write it like this, what you see is the logical information is on the left, and then the stabilizer checks are on the right. Um, and then, um, yeah, then we can say, well, what happens if I? So now I'm gonna. Uh, okay. So now if I apply x one to a zero 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 plus b one one one.
And then um, what happens when I apply it in the other um, operation? Yeah, I there's a subtlety I'm trying not to get cut up on, which is that um in this case one logical zero logical refers to the eigenvalues with respect to z logical and isn't necessarily it's not the same zero one logical state, right? Because it's because uh, we've taken this entangled state and I've separated it into these different degrees of freedom. Okay, so what's great about this is if I measure this state, it indeed collapses to minus, right? That's totally fine. Um, but it doesn't disturb the superposition A1 logical plus B0 logical at all. The superposition is fine because we haven't we haven't measured it. We haven't asked a question about Z logic. So then after I do this, I see, oh, I'm like, okay, I get minus and I get plus. And I'm like, all right, well, then what I need to do is apply um, the, <laughs> I need to apply X1 to fix. And when I apply X1, um, everything goes back to where it should be. So I think when we write it, um, uh, <laughs> Yeah, I guess let me let me roll back for a second. So I just want to say, right? So the key thing is this entangled state. The whole point of the entangled state really is that um, local noise can't can't uh, shouldn't be able to corrupt the relative amplitude of this data if I have just like single noise. And so. It's a little bit easier in my mind to see why the measurement doesn't cause any problem when we shift to this kind of weird basis, which is the basis of the stabilizer um, measurements and the basis of the Z logical measurement. In that basis, it's really clear um, to me anyway, uh, that if I measure the, and I hope you can see it in this tensor product here, um, that if I measure the, the, the parity part, like it does not like it doesn't do anything to the logical part, but it tells me it's like it does give me the information I need to fix the logical part back to the right, um, so that zero and one are properly labeled again. Yeah, and so there's this question about why did the A and B coefficients swap with the X one operation? Um, because the, uh, the, yeah, they swapped with the, um, <laughs> they swapped with the AB operation because X1 doesn't commute with Z logical. And then, um, let me just say, I, I want to say that this is true. Right, so um, for plus us one, the stabilizer um, the the stabilizer returns its positive value. So it's again, it's just um, yeah, I. I
sorry, what I want to say is I feel like a lot of quantum mechanics problems are all about picking the right basis. And for me, this basis of where I think about the stabilizer um, outcomes uh, is helpful to explain why the measurement doesn't affect the logical data. Um, but, um, but I will say that it's, uh, it is a little bit, you, usually people just talk at this level of like the zero, zero, zeros and one, one, ones. And then by the time you move to stabilizers, you usually don't talk about the state anymore. This question about why do we need three copies is actually just because I need enough space to have Z's one way and X is the one way. Oh yeah. Um, yeah, so, so in this case, there are two stabilizer generators. So there are four syndrome, so there, so, so there are four possible error syndromes. Either everything's fine, zero, zero, one, zero, zero, one. Um, if, if, if one of the edge ones are wrong and one, one, if the acute in the middle is flipped. Okay. Um, all right, so let's go back and see how Shore allows us to fix everything. And I think it'll also clarify a little bit the um, why we need all these pieces. Okay, so we went through the level one code, we went through the level two code, and now when I look at the stabilizers all together, <laughs> it's all of them, right? It's the stabilizers of all the level one code here, and then stabilizers from the level two code here, and then we have these nice three, um, we have a choice of these three qubit logical operators. Um, and of course, we can move them by applying different sorts of stabilizers. Um, and then again, I, I'm just trying to show you different representations. So in this, rep this representation, which I think again, uh, this kind of graphical representation of spin interactions, um, I think is very appealing to physicists. Uh, you can see that there are actually these little um, kind of Ising models on each of these edges and these like weight six checks that connect them. Here I am rewriting them as these poly operators, um, again, geometrically. So instead of labeling them by qubit number, I just you know put them out on this grid. Um, the important thing is um, you never see errors. You only see checks, right? And so the, 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 you need to decide when you see these checks, like what, well, what am I gonna do? So what kind of errors could lead to this check? So um, here I've drawn, uh, three errors that could lead to this check. Um, so first, first, let's just go through how I've decided that's the case. Um, man, that slide is all messed up. All right. The, uh, so again, in this, in our picture, the reds are Zs and the blues are X type objects. So if I have two, blue checks that are broken, it means that I has to have had a Z type error. So the Z type error could be here at the center, at the top center, and that would flip these two because it doesn't commute with these two X checks. It could be in the middle, same thing, or it could be two Z errors, one Z error here in the bottom and this Z should be here in the middle. And um, when this happens, you have to decide what to fix, right? Like you need some rule. <laughs> so let's say our rule is we always just fix the top Z. So, um, so if we do that here, the error was Z. 
And when we apply the fix, the Z goes away and we get back the perfect state. Here, when we apply um, the Z on the top, we get a stabilizer. So these two Zs are equivalent to nothing. And so it also goes away. Um, in this case, when we apply, because we have these two Z errors, when we apply this Z in the center, um, and then we shift things around with the stabilizers, we end up generating the logical Z, right? So error correction is not, you know, <laughs> it's not magic. Uh, this type of error correcting code can only correct one Z error, or one X error, or one Z and one X. Um, but when we, uh, yeah, but, but if there are two Z errors that span um, the code, then our rule for correction leads to this logical Z. And I think this is a good place, again, to take some questions. So one question is like, why are we only dealing with X and Z errors and not more? channel into operators. Yeah, so um <laughs> one, two, three. Uh, so I hope at the very end of this class I'll explain. But the basic idea is we use the fact that poly operators are a um poly operators form a basis of all operators. So regardless of what the error is, we can always rewrite it as a sum of polys. Um, because we can think of a Y error as being an X error and a Z error together, um, it's possible to only check that X errors and Z errors are fixed. Um, and yeah, again, I'll talk a little bit more about that. But that's a great question. I think that's, that's really the heart of how things work. So what is this um, Z zero B here? Oh, so Z, Z so so in my original, um, so the way I label these qubits zero one two A B C, so Z zero B is just the Z here. So if the underlying error was Z zero B, if we apply Z zero B, we get nothing since z zero b times z zero b is the identity. If it's um, z one b, which is this error, we get z zero b times z one b, but that's the same as this red stabilizer bar here. So it's also no error. And here, if the applied z's are z two a and z one c, when I apply z zero b, um, I get Z's that stretch across. And just remember that on each of these um, repetition codes that fixes X errors, a Z on any qubit is the same as the Z anywhere else. So we just move the Z's up and we get this nice line. Can okay, you please um, repeat like, um, what do you mean by when Z error is on the top or in the top? No? Yeah, so, um, yeah, let me, oh, let me, okay. So remember for our classical code, um, so for our classical code, um, each of these bits can go through some channel. And then a bit flip is an X. So we say, okay, if a bit flip happens on a middle bit, the outcome is zero, one, zero. And if I ask for the parities between this guy and this guy, I see both parities are minus one. So the fix should be I'm going to label these guys 0, 1, and 2. Should be x1. 
right? Um, similarly for classical code, it uh, this X happens here. Um, Um, yeah, the X happens here. And this is the parity checks are minus one and plus one. And the fix is X zero. So now in the quantum code, um, we have these nine qubits. And they don't, I, I've only laid them out on a grid for my own um, ease. We could think of them as a line. And then you want to think that these qubits, um, yeah, maybe, yeah. right? Uh, okay, so this is. Okay, so we have these um, nine qubits, and then we're just going to apply an error somewhere. Um, and the error, yeah, and the error we, uh, yeah, it doesn't matter where the error happens. Um, but then we measure some checks, and we see that the checks that are broken um, are these. Uh, X type checks here, right? And then I want to ask, well, like, how could that happen? So, one way it could happen is if this qubit 0b, um, if it was the one that flipped. So, uh, here's the qubit 0b. I can say, okay, maybe. Z zero B happens here. Um, the important thing is that's not the only choice, right? So um, Z zero B, uh, actually everything in B, Z one B, Z two B, all give the same error pattern. And then pairs that, that, that come from the two sides, like this is our example one, Z two A, Z one C. Um, also give the same pattern, right? So then, then we just have to pick something to fix, and we we, in our example, we choose to fix this, and then that's justified if we think single qubit errors are more likely than two qubit errors. Now you could say for single qubit errors, I could also pick this one or this one, which is fine, that's true. Um, but it turns out because on that line, um, those errors become equivalent up to stabilizers. It doesn't matter which one you pick. The only thing that changes is if there are really two errors, then by applying this fix, you create a logical error. You create a logical Z. Yeah. I don't ask like, uh, why does the Z occur on vertices, but the X occurs on the line? Yeah, sorry. So this this um, I was trying to match my cartoon, but this this X isn't. It, this is just like a, the I, I just mean the check is bad. Bad check. It's not an X. Like we get the negative value from the check. That's a great question. Sorry for the confusion.
Okay, so uh, so so I just wanted to talk about the error correction condition. So I, I write it here, and then I'm going to try to explain it as a cartoon as well. So the basic idea is you have some logical states, um, which are an orthogonal basis of logical states. And then the error correction condition says you can correct some set of errors, EL through EM, if um, the product of these errors uh, preserves the orthogonality of the states and, um, and the contraction of the states doesn't depend on the states themselves. It only depends on the errors. Now, what's nice um, is for, uh, yeah, what's really nice is for, for stabilizer codes of poly errors, this thing simplifies a lot, which is that these Cs are either one if the two errors end up being in the stabilizer, um, or it's, it's uh, zero otherwise, which means basically that there's no collision, that these these two states don't map. These two errors don't map. Um, two distinct logical states to the same state. Just give people a second to write this down. So I just, again, graphically, the way I think about it is Hilbert space is some huge space. And then the code space is a subspace in that space. And what an error does is it maps you to a different subspace. And what you need is you need the, the simplest condition um, is we need these, these errors that are independent to map to independent subspaces so that we can correct them, right? That's, that's, the, that's the most important part, that the errors map to different places. Um, it's not exactly, uh, I mean, that's exactly correct, but you just have to remember that it's the error up to stabilizers, right? So if two things that you think of as different errors, like C1 or C2, up to stabilizers are the same error in shifting your space, um, in this picture, we think of them as different errors. So then what do you do is you just see, you wait some time and you just ask, well, what subspace am I in? You don't, right? You don't ask anything about the information. You just say, well, what subspace am I in? And then if it's correctable, we can map it back because these subspaces are distinct back to the code space. Um, yeah, and then I'll, yeah, I'll take, I just want to point out that this should look really familiar to you with respect to um, this idea of like code words and the, the distance between code words, uh, right? That we, we basically need to avoid collisions. And it's the same thing, but now it's just in this Hilbert space instead of the space of bit strings. So questions about the quantum error correction condition? So what happens if the detectable errors error maps to a non-orthogonal subspace? Uh, well, so I mean, you you then get into this case. I mean, it's there are kind of two answers. The one answer is that it's possible to think about doing approximate error correction where you don't have this strong error correction condition and you just say, well, there's some probabilistic chance things go bad. Um, but generally I think of it as a, um, I don't know how to say it. I just think of it as constructive. Like I wanna design a code. A, a good property of a code is to make sure these errors go different places. And then any code you make, there will be some errors that that do map to the same place. So we saw these weight two errors had the same effect as this weight one error. And that's why uh, you know, any error correcting code can't fix anything. <laughs> it can only fix errors up to some size or parameter space. 
Yeah, so the short code is nice because it starts with the repetition code, which is the easiest classical code. Uh, there's a question, there's a, one part of the short code, which is not, um, yeah, not nice, is that the, the single qubit Z errors um, are somehow equivalent. And that's it's just weird from a classical coding perspective. Um, and I put a tech answer to the chat, but that's just really, um, those types of codes are called degenerate, meaning that the um, different Z errors correspond to the same effective logical action because of this, this space. Um, and we'll see, yeah, that's kind of a, a, a feature and a bug of, of quantum codes. Um, so what is the smallest code that we can make? Um, and I think a really nice way to think about it has to do with the equivalent of uh, a real clear equivalent to these like code word blocks in classical coding theory. So a distance three code can only correct one error. And each qubit, if we assume they can only have poly errors, which we, we need to show that in a second, um, each qubit, if it has only a poly error, can go to X or to Y or to Z. And if we think of the map, which maps um, those points away, right? Um, it means that um, if we want to have the, the code words, but in this case, the code states um, separated, we need um, basically three times the number of qubits making up the code, extra points, plus the code we want to be in different spots. And so that's the, the left-hand side of this equation. It said, or the, sorry, the right-hand side of the equation. It says that we need um, to, to fix, uh, to have a distance three code to fix one poly error of any type on any qubit. Um, we need at least two, because we want a qubit, so we have a code space, times what if nothing happens? Good, we just sit there. Plus these three different poly operators times the number of qubits they can act on. Um, it has to be smaller than the size of the whole Hilbert space. Like we don't mind if there's more space, right? We don't mind if the, the, the code states are further separated. Um, but this, it can't really get more compact than this. It's sort of like, um, yeah, just like, just like we need three bits to do error correction uh, for bit flip errors, uh, we can't really shrink this down. And we find um, that this is satisfied for uh, five qubits. Um, and just two to the five is 32, two times 16 is 32. Uh, and so that's kind of like the smallest code we can make that fixes that one error. So um, here's a, just an example of um, three distance three codes. Uh, the first distance three code is, is this minimal code. So it only takes, um, has five qubits. The stabilizers um, are mixtures of X and Z types and um, it's a little bit hard to represent graphically, but I think of each of these stabilizers as kind of being uh, like a four bit thing, which wraps around this pentagon as I kind of cycle around. Um, the steam code and here, the numbering on this box is backwards. So I have zero, one, zero is here and six is at this end. Um, it has, uh, yeah, it has six checks X types and Z types, um, and they correspond. If I if I draw it graphically like this, they correspond to these different faces, um, and and then notably they're the same. So these top ones look like X's, the bottom ones look like Z's, um, and yeah. So that's that's a that's a nice property of this code. Um, and so it actually makes it easier to do logical gates 
uh, which I can't really go into today, but um, it's an advantage for single cubic gates. And then this is the shore code written out this way, where we see again, these massive weight six X checks and all these uh, weight two Z checks. And it's a little bit hard to see because um, of the font, but right, they basically break into three separate objects. And what you can show is actually that um, this can actually fix more bit flips than Steen. Um, and so that's kind of the, there can be a trade-off along these lines. So it turns out in practice, um, because of, of not just preserving memory, but doing computation, um, five qubit code is not that attractive. Um, the uh, Steen code and short code, um, there are definitely benefits for both sides. Um, but of course, what we want to do is we want to uh, get to larger distances and, and think about more errors. Um, all right. So the, the next thing, uh, if you're paying really close attention, uh, you may notice that these basically look like, I mean, these are classical parity checks um, where I've replaced ones with X's or Z's and zeros with I's. And we saw a little bit of that earlier. So I wanna talk a bit about that. And then I wanna talk a bit more about this idea of how um, we can always use poly errors as a, as a map for our errors in this qubit space. But any quick questions about these? Uh, well, I mean, yeah. Um, yeah, quick questions about these codes. Could you quickly um, explain again how Shore can fix more errors than Steam if they are already sensory codes? Yeah, so um, on the homework, um, uh, yeah, <laughs> the homework is too hard for sure, but the uh, problem three, um, I think the, the, the one way to think about it is, what if I have two X errors on Steam? So both of them can correct any single X error because they're distance three. So let's think about two X errors on Steam. So Shilin, why don't you just pick two random numbers? How about just five and six? That okay? Yeah, per. Okay, so 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 there's an X error on five and an X error on six, and then I look to see which of these parity checks are flipped. So let me I can go to. Okay, so there's an X error here. There's an X error here. Um, and I can look here and say, okay, these are just X checks, so they're all fine. And then I've labeled these guys this way on this slide, dot, dot, dot. Um, and so we see this guy becomes negative because it has the five or the six, this guy becomes negative because it has the five. This guy remains positive because um, it corresponds to, yeah, my colors are off. I, yeah, my colors are off. I, sorry, I tried to do some last minute relabeling this morning, always a mistake. So um, it's too bad. So this yellow guy here is somehow the blue guy. Uh, I'll fix it when I post it. All right, so, so then this guy is positive, this guy is negative, and this guy is negative. And so I ask myself, what is the smallest X flip that will make this error happen? And it has to be, um, an X error here on three. But this 
it turns out for this code, x3, x5, x6 is an example of a logical x operator. this x5 and x6. Um, so you can show, I mean, right, Shilin just picked it randomly, hopefully. Uh, you can basically show that any choice you make of two logical x's will always lead to a logical error when you fix it. Um, on this side, I can have a logical x error here and a logical x error here. And because the correction just depends on um, each column independently, it can correct both of these x flips. So I, I guess you're saying uh, physical x error. Physical x error, yeah. Can you correct both of these physical bit flips? Whereas here in the Steam code, I can't fix two physical bit flips. Um, but, but, but I just want to be clear, like the, uh, these codes, these three, these, these distance three codes are all very similar in property and like, uh, the in practice of which one you should use when is really, uh, depends on a lot of details. Um, so, uh, why the picture of the steam post there, three dimensional cube? Um. Yeah, so so it's just pictorial. It's it's just pictorial. Uh, it it's you you it's um, Steam code is an example of a type of code called a color code. Um, and the color code we can think about is a three colorable graph in a plane. The smallest example, which is the Steam code, um, basically leads to this nice cubic looks like a cube when we we draw it. Um, also, can, um, sorry, can, can I, do you want to move yeah. on or, okay. Well, yeah, so we, I guess we have 15 minutes left, is that right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I just want to make, let me just make two points in this last 15 minutes. Uh, uh, and then, uh, of course, we can discuss, during discussion, we can talk about many other things. Um, so, oh, come on. Okay, so I just, for completeness, and because I promised people I would do these things, um, I don't know. Okay, so the first thing is, if I think about, so this is going to be all poly matrices, and I can pick, you know, any one of them, um, and I think it's useful to, you know, you could say, like, I, I think it's useful to think about labeling them. Um, um, by a list, right? So let's say my poly operator is um, x, you know, x, i, z, y, i. Um, and what I want to do is I want to associate each poly operator with a number. And I'm going to label, I'm going to give them kind of funny numbers, which is zero, one, um, two, I think labeling Z is two is a little weird to me. Y is three, um, from a, from a physics standpoint. Um, it'll be useful later. So then any poly operator I could think of is just this list of numbers. One, zero, two, three, zero. Okay. Now, what's nice about the poly operators is, um, on M, qubits, uh, they form a 
complete basis for two of the n matrices, complex matrices that is So meaning that if I have two um, uh, so say two different poly operators J and K, if I multiply them together and I take the trace, um, I either get um, two to the m. or I get zero. Um, so, so mathematically, this uh, having an orthogonal basis is just like super handy. So I can actually take any matrix on 2 to the m states, and I can write it as a complex sum of these poly operators, um, where j goes from 0 to, um, well, yeah, there's a lot of them, 4 to the m. Now, I can easily determine, I can use the trace condition above to easily determine what the coefficients are if you give me a matrix and back and forth. So the thing I wanted to bring up at the, this is, so, so I'm definitely rushing, I apologize, I just want, key thing is if I think about a quantum channel which maps a density matrix to a density matrix, that quantum channel can always be written um, in terms of Krauss operators. Now these Krauss operators um, have to satisfy the condition uh, These Krauss operators have to satisfy the condition that they uh, basically sum to the identity, which makes guarantees that the map is um, completely positive and trace preserving, which is important for our usual idea of quantum mechanics. Now, each of these um, Krauss operators, like any operator, can be rewritten in terms of this sum of poly operators. And then what, what, what measuring the syndrome does Yeah, and then just because I because of how I work, I just have to say <laughs> it assumes everything is completely positive uh, and trace preserving, which 
relies on the fact that your states are actually qubits. Um, and so some of my own research has been into like, well, what happens when your states aren't really qubits, all, kind of, all kinds of, uh, of uh, caveats. But in practice, this is why correcting poly errors is enough, is that any channel, we can write any channel like this with these Krauss operators, depends on the physical system. Any Krauss operator, we can write as a sum of poly operators because we can write any operator as a sum of poly operators. When we measure the error syndrome, we collapse the channel onto, onto poly operators, basically, uh, to, yeah, to the parts that like are comp, we collapse the channel into the parts which are consistent with some set of poly operators, and then we can do the fix. Now, again, error correction doesn't work all the time. So, you know, this, these collapsed poly operators, some will correspond to um, errors that we'll fix when we fix, and some will correspond to a logical error after we fix. And that's the challenge of um, coming up with the right kind of decoder and deciding the right sort of things. And then, uh, <laughs> yeah, so I, uh, yeah, I'm way out of time. Um, I really appreciate all the questions. I uh, was perhaps a little bit too ambitious. Um, I just wanted to make one last point, which is if I, again, if I take this um, kind of funny numbering and then I rewrite it in binary, The thing which becomes really interesting is that these um, syndrome stabilizer checks can be written as binary vectors. And then what we normally do is we, um, what we normally do is we arrange them so that the second bit and the first bit are sort of pulled apart as a function of qubits. Um, so I normally have like the z bits and then the x bits. And if we, um, yeah, I just wanna look back this for a second. Um, when I look at, say, the z bit, it becomes 1, 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, right? Um, and this, Um, come on, computer. Um, so this is the same as Z, I, I, Z, Z, Z. And, um, what I don't have time to get into, but I hope to get into today, uh, building off of Jens's excellent lecture, is that there's a type of code called Calder Bank Steen Shore, which are basically
Yeah, which are basically these two parity check matrices of two different codes, CZ and CX. And then there have to be some rules which allow us to choose what type of code CZ and what type of code CX is allowed. But we can always take one classical code, say a CZ, to figure out how to fix X errors, and then find a code CX um, which is compatible with it. And uh, it's really it's really quite nice because the um, all of the this information about linear coding theory is how we yeah I don't know how we work on codes and think about codes and do this sort of thing. I do think um, so. Tomorrow, uh, Austin Fowler will start on the surface code. So the surface code is also um, a a CSS code. And it's just, um, I think because of the fact that it's kind of come from the physics side, uh, it really focuses on um, the stabilizer generators as local operators in space. And so it's, it's really, I mean, yeah, it's pretty rare for people to rewrite it in terms of these parity check matrices of classical codes but they are indeed um, classical codes with the, uh, yeah, so surface code. But it turns out they're not, um, <laughs> the surface code in the end, the, the code is not a very good classical code. So it's kind of, to me, it's like really intriguing because the sort of like one of our best quantum codes uh, when you look at the classical parts that make it up, they're like you. They're not very promising classical codes. So um, yeah. So with that, I just wanted to say there's a huge amount of codes. I think this linear code work um, is really useful. Um, it's just a different way. It allows us. To, it's an easy way for us to like represent stabilizers and um, to, to generate these stabilizer codes. Even these codes, which are not CSS codes, um, we can use classical coding theory to understand how they work and use it to think about logical operators and all these other pieces. Um, I think, uh, again, when you actually make codes, you have to worry about like how, like, you know, one question that came up a lot was like, well, how do you measure them? And so typically we measure them using interactions with some syndrome qubits, which we then measure and throw away. And so um, Austin, I'm sure we'll cover this with, uh, with respect to the surface code tomorrow. Um, and then the, the day after John Martinez will talk about like how you actually design that into an experiment. Um, I guess I do wanna say that the one thing one nice thing about surface codes and these topological codes is that you can think about everything being local, which is promising for building certain things. Um, but there are some features of having local codes which makes it really hard to um, to to think about having like finite rate. And I saw early on there was a question about whether or not I'd cover hypergraph product codes. Uh, no, unfortunately, we are definitely out of time. Um, but I guess we have a break and then uh, we'll come back and I'm happy to talk about anything. Sure, thanks so much, Ken. Um, so I thought I would just give folks a little bit of a, just confirm our plan for the day. So I think we're uh, ready for a stretch break and the plan, Ken, was for us to go to Gather Town so that people could work in their small groups. Um, is that still sounding right based on the homework assignment they have? Yeah, so I, so, okay, so on the homework assignment, um, I think you guys, I hope you guys can do one. I think you should try to do two. I think you should think about three. I think it's a really nice conceptual problem. I think the last problem four um, is for experts in the crowd, uh, but tries to build, builds off um, a little bit of, from, from Jens' class, um, but we weren't, Unfortunately, we didn't get quite as far as I wanted to to make that as concrete as I would like. Okay. But I think all the, the TAs, um, there are a number of TAs from my group and Robert Calderbrink's group, um, can, I'm sure can solve all the problems. So if you wanna 
if your group solves the easiest problems first and wants to try the more challenging problem, uh, there'll be plenty of help. Great. So I just put in the chat a link to a document that has guidance on um, navigating Gather Town. Um, I can walk folks through just a little bit, but in terms of timing, if we broke, we took a break now at 1130, would we want to reconvene in Gather Town at 12? Yeah, Does that that's sound okay? Okay. That's so um, if you stop sharing screen, I will then share screen and just do a quick walkthrough for folks.